looks like you're both here. I'm assuming it's the two of you. Okay. Alright, so we left off. He was walking back to the university and he had felt a burning sensation and went into the river to cool himself off and that's kind of where we left off. Um, and now we're starting chapter 23. Principles. I did tell Mola, I said as I shuffled the cards. She said it was all in my head and pushed me out the door. Well, I can only guess what that feels like, Sim said bitterly. <laughs> like clockwork. Where have you been in the six second I start reading? Oh my god, you are ridiculous. You just... Uh, the, my, the reading attracts him or something. Um... Or maybe it's the first time he's heard me speak today. Anyway, um... I looked up, surprised by the uncharacteristic sharpness in his voice, but before I could ask what was the matter, Willem caught my eye and shook his head, warning me away. Knowing Sam's history, I guessed it was another quick, painful end to another quick, painful relationship. I kept my mouth shut and dealt, with it, dealt another hand of breath. The three of us were killing time, waiting for the room to fill up before I started playing for my typical felling night crowd at Anchor's. <laughs> cat. The cat just senses the notifications. She's going live. I must go to her. Um, what do you think is the matter? Willem asked. I hesitated, worried that if I spoke my fears aloud, it might somehow make them true. I might have exposed myself to something dangerous in the fishery. Will looked at me. Such as? Some of the compounds we use, I said. They'll go straight through your skin and kill you in 18 slow ways. I thought, back, I thought back to the day my tenton glass had cracked in the fishery, of the single drop of transporting agent that had landed on my shirt. It was only a tiny drop, barely larger than the head of a nail. I was so certain it hadn't touched my skin. I hope that's not it, but I don't know now what else, but I don't know what else it might be. It could be a lingering effect from the plumb bob, Sim said, grimly. Ambrose isn't much of an alchemist, and from what I understand, one of the main ingredients is lead. If he factored it himself, some latent principles could be affecting your system. Did you eat or drink anything different today? I thought about it. I had a fair bit of methaglin at the Aeolian, I admitted. That stuff will make anyone ill, Will said darkly. I like it, Sim said, but it's practically a nostrum all by itself. There's a lot of different tincturing going on in there. Nothing alchemical, but you've got nutmeg, thyme, clove, all manner of spices. Could be that one of them triggered some of the free principles lurking in your system. Wonderful, I grumbled. And how do I go about fixing that, exactly? Sim spread his hands helplessly. That's what I thought, I said. Still, it sounds better than metal poisoning. Simon proceeded to take four tricks in a row with, with a clever card force, and by the end of the hand he was smiling again. Sim was never really given to extended brooding. Will squared his cards away, and I pushed my chair back from the table. Play the one... About the drunk cow and the butter churn, Sim said. I couldn't help but crack a smile. Maybe later, I said, as I picked up my increasingly shabby loot case and made my way to the hearth amid the sound of scattered, familiar applause. It took me a long moment to open the case, untwisting the copper wire I, I was still using in place of a buckle. For the next two hours I played. I sang Copper Bottom Pot, Lilac Bow, Bow and Aunt M's Tub. The audience laughed and clapped and cheered. As I lingered my way through the songs, I felt my worries slough away. My music has always been the best remedy for my dark moods. As I sang, even my bruises seemed to pain me less. Then I felt a chill, as if a strong winter wind was blowing down the chimney behind me. I fought off a shiver and finished the last verse of Applejack, when I'd finally played to keep, which I'd finally played to keep Sim happy. When I struck the last chord, the, the crowd applauded and conversation slowly welled up to fill the room again. I looked behind me at the fireplace, but the fire was burning cheerfully with no sign of a draft. I stepped down off the hearth, hoping a little walk would chase my chill away. But as soon as I took a few steps, I realized that wasn't the case. The cold settled straight into my bones. I turned back to the fireplace, spreading my hands to warm them. Will and Sim appeared at my side. What's going on? Sim asked. You look like you're going to be sick. Something like that, I said, clenching my teeth to keep them from chattering. Go tell Anchor I'm feeling ill and have to cut it short tonight. Then light a candle off this fire and bring it up to my room. I looked up at their serious faces. Will, can you help me get out of here? I don't want to make a scene. 
Willem nodded and gave me his arm. I leaned on him and con concentrated on keeping my body from shaking as we made our way to the stairs. No one paid us much attention. I probably looked more drunk than anything. My hands were numb and heavy. My lips felt icy cold. After the first flight of stairs, I couldn't keep my shaking under control any longer. I could still walk, but the thick muscles in my legs twitched with every step. Will stopped. We should go to the Medica. While he didn't sound different, his sealedish accent was thicker and he was starting to drop words, a sign he was genuinely worried. I shook my head firmly and leaned forward, knowing he'd have to help me up the stairs or let me fall. Willem put an arm around me and half steadied, half carried me the rest of the way. Once in my tiny room, say hi to the camera. You want to look at the camera? <laughs> Once in my tiny room, I staggered onto the bed. Will wrapped a blanket around my shoulders. There were footsteps in the hallway, and Sim peered nervously around the door. He held a stub of candle, sheltering the flame with his other hand as he walked. I've got it. What do you want it for, anyway? There, I pointed to the table beside the bed. You... You lit it off the fire? Sim's eyes were frightened. Your lips, he said. They're not a good color. I pried a splinter from the rough wood of the bedside table and jabbed it hard on into the back of my head, hand. Blood welled up and I rolled the long splinter around in it, getting it wet. Close the door, I said. You are not doing what I think you're doing, Sim said firmly. I jabbed the long splinter down into the soft wax of the candle alongside the burning wick. It sputtered a little bit, and then the flame wrapped around it. I muttered two bindings, one right after the other, speaking slowly so my numb lips didn't slur the words. "'What are you doing?' Sim demanded. "'Are you trying to cook yourself?' When I didn't answer him, he stepped forward as if he would knock the candle over. Will caught his arm. "'His hands are like ice,' he said quietly. "'He's cold. Really cold.' Sim's eyes darted nervously between the two of us. He took a step back. "'Just... just be careful.' But I was already ignoring him. I closed my eyes and bound the candle flame to the, di to the fire downstairs. Then I carefully made the second connection between the blood on the splinter and the blood in my body. It was very much like what I'd done with the drop of wine at the Aeolian, with the obvious exception that I didn't want my blood to boil. At first there was just a brief tickle of heat, not nearly enough. I concentrated harder and felt my entire body relax as warmth flooded through me. I kept my eyes closed, keeping my attention on the bindings until I could take several long, deep breaths without any shuddering or shaking. I opened my eyes and saw my two friends looking on expectantly. I smiled at them. I'm okay. But before I got the words out, I began to sweat. I was suddenly too warm, nauseatingly warm. I broke both bindings as quickly as you jerk your hand away from a hot iron stove. I took a few deep breaths, then got to my feet and walked over to the window. I opened it and leaned heavily on the sill, enjoying the chill autumn air that smelled of dead leaves and coming rain. There was a long moment of silence. That looked like binder's chills, Simmons said. Really bad binder's chills. It felt like the chills, I said. Maybe your body has lost the ability to regulate its own temperate, Willem suggested. Temperature, Sim corrected him absently. That wouldn't account for the burn across my chest, I said. Sim cocked his head. Burn? I was wet with sweat now, so I was glad for an excuse to unbutton my shirt and pull it off over my head. A large portion of my chest and upper arm was a bright red, a sharp contrast to my ordinarily pale skin. Mola said it was a rash, and I was being fussy as an old woman, but it wasn't there before I jumped into the river. Sim leaned close to look. I still think it's unbound principles, he said. They can do bizarre things to a person. We had an Elyr last term that wasn't careful with its factoring. He ended up not being able to sleep or focus his eyes for almost two span. Willem slouched into a chair. What makes a man cold, then cold, then hot, then cold again? Sim gave a half-hearted smile. Sounds like a riddle. I hate riddles, I said, reaching for my shirt. Then I yelped, clutching at the bare biceps of my left arm. Blood welled out between my fingers. Sim bolted to his feet, looking around frantically obviously at a loss for what to do. It felt like I'd been stabbed by an invisible knife. God! Blackened! Damn! I gritted out between my clenched teeth. I pulled my hand away and saw the small, round wound in my arm that had come from nowhere. Simmons' expression was horrified, his eyes wide, his hands covering his mouth. He said something, but I was too busy concentrating to listen. I already knew what he was saying, anyway. Malfeasance. Of course. This was all malfeasance. Someone was attacking me. I lowered myself into the heart of stone and brought all my alar to bear. But my unknown attacker wasn't wasting any time. There was a sharp pain in my chest near the shoulder. It didn't break the skin this time, but I watched a blotch of dark blue blossom under my skin. I hardened my alar, and the next stab was, a, was little more than a pinch. 
Then I quickly broke my mind into three pieces and gave two of them the job of maintaining the alara that protected me. Only then did I let out a deep sigh. I'm fine. Simon gave a laugh that choked off into a sob. His hands still covered his mouth. How can you say that? He demanded, plainly horrified. I looked down at myself. Blood was still welling up through my fingers, running down the back of my hand and my arm. It's true, I said to him. Honestly, Sim. But malfeasance, he said. It just isn't done. I sat down on the edge of my bed, keeping pressure on my wound. I think we have some pretty clear proof otherwise. Willem sat back down. I am with Simmon. I would never have believed this. He made an angry gesture. Arcanists do not do this anymore. It is insane. He looked at me. Why are you smiling? I'm relieved, I said honestly. I was worried I'd given myself cadm cadmium poisoning or I had some mysterious disease. This is just someone trying to kill me. How could someone do it? Simmon asked. I don't mean morally. How did someone get hold of your blood or hair? Willem looked at Simmon. What did you do with the bandages after you stitched him up? I burned them, Sim said defensively. I'm not an idiot. Will made a calming gesture. I'm just narrowing down our options. It probably isn't the Medica, either. They're careful about that sort of thing. Simmons stood up. We have to tell someone, he looked at Willem. Would Jameson still be in his office at this time of night? Sim, I said. How about we just wait for a while? What? Simmons said. Why? The only evidence I have are my injuries, I said. That means they'll want someone at the Medica to examine me. And when that happens... With one hand still clamped over my bloody arm, I waved my bandaged elbow. I look remarkably like someone who fell off a roof just a couple days ago. Sim sat back down in his chair. It's only been three days, hasn't it? I nodded. I'd be expelled. And Mola would be in trouble for not mentioning my injuries. Master Arwell isn't forgiving about that sort of thing. The two of you would probably be implicated, too. I don't want that. We were quiet for a moment. The only sound was the distant clamor of the busy tap room below. I sat down on the bed. Do we even need to discuss who's doing this? Sim asked. Ambrose, I said. It's always Ambrose. He must have found He must have found some of my blood on a piece of roofing tile. I should have thought of that days ago. How would he know it was yours? Simon asked. Because I hate him, I said bitterly. Of course he knows it was me. Will was slowly shaking his head. No, it's not like him. <laughs> Not like him, Simmon demanded. He had that woman dose Kvoth with the plum with the plum bob. That's as bad as poison. He hired those men to jump Kvoth in the alley last term. My point exactly, Willem said. Ambrose doesn't do things to Kvoth. He arranges for other people to do them. He got some woman to dose him. He paid thugs to knife you. I expect he didn't even do that, really. I'll bet someone else set it up for him. It's all the same, I said. We know he's behind it. Willem frowned at me. You're not thinking straight. It's not that Ambrose isn't a bastard. He is. But he's a clever bastard. He's careful to distance himself from anything he does. Sim looked uncertain. Will has a point. When you were hired on as house musician at the Horse and Four, he didn't buy the place and fire you. He had Baron Petra's son-in-law do it. No connection to him at all. No connection here, either, I said. That's the whole point of sympathy. It's indirect. Will shook his head again. If you got knifed in an alley, people would be shocked. But such things happen all the time, all over the world. But if you fell down in public and started gushing blood from malfeasance, people would be horrified. The masters would, uh, the masters would suspend classes. Rich merchants and nobles would hear of it and pull their children from their studies. They'd bring the constables over from Imra. Simon rubbed his forehead and looked up at the ceiling thoughtfully. Then he nodded to himself, first slowly, then with more certainty. It makes sense, he said. If Ambrose had found some blood, he could have turned it over to Jameson and had him douse out, douse out the thief. There wouldn't have been any need to get folks in the Medica to look for suspicious injuries and such. Ambrose likes his revenge, I pointed out grimly. He could have hidden the blood from Jameson, kept it for himself. Willem was shaking his head. Sim sighed. Will's right. There aren't, any, there aren't that many sympathists, and everyone knows Ambrose is carrying a grudge against you. He's too careful to do something like this. It would point right to him. Besides, Willem said, how long has this been going on? Days and days. Do you honestly think Ambrose could go this long without rubbing your nose in it? Not even a little? You have a point, I admitted reluctantly. That's not like him. I knew it had to be Ambrose. I could feel it deep in my gut. In a strange way, I almost wanted, I almost wanted it to be him. It would make things so much simpler. But wanting something doesn't make it so. I took a deep breath and forced myself to think about it rationally. It would be reckless of him, I admitted at last. And he isn't the sort to get his hands dirty. I sighed. Fine. Wonderful. 
as if one person trying to ruin my life wasn't enough. Who could it be? Simon asked. Your average person can't do this sort of thing with hair, am I right? Dahl could, I said, or Kilvin. It is probably safe to assume, Willem said dryly, that none of the masters are trying to kill you. Then it has to be someone with his blood, Sim said. I tried to ignore the sinking sensation in the pit of my stomach. There is someone with my blood, I said, but I don't think she could be responsible. Will and Sim turned to look at me, and I immediately regretted saying anything. Why would someone have your blood? Sim asked. I hesitated, then realized there was no way to avoid telling them at this point. I borrowed money from Devi at the beginning of the term. Neither one of them reacted the way I expected, which is to say, neither one reacted at all. Who's Devi? Sim asked. I started to relax. Maybe they hadn't heard of her. That would certainly make things easier. She's a gaylet who lives across the river, I said. Okay, Simmons said easily. What's a gaylet? Remember when we went to see the ghost and the goose girl, I asked him. Kettler was a gaylet. Oh, a copper hawk, Sim said, his face brightening with realization, then darkening again as he realized the implications. I didn't know there were any of those sort of people around here. Those sort of people are everywhere, I said. The world wouldn't work without them. Wait, Willem said suddenly, holding up his hand. Did you say you're... He paused, struggling to remember the appropriate word in Auturin. Your loner, your gaitisur, was named Devi? His steeldish accent was thick around her name, so it sounded like David. I nodded. This was the reaction I'd expected. Oh, God, Simmons said, aghast. You mean demon Devi, don't you? mean demon Devi, don't you? That was so, some alliteration there. Uh, I sighed. So you've heard of her. Heard of her? Sim said, his voice going shrill. She was expelled during my first term. It left a real impression. Willem simply closed his eyes and shook his head, as if he couldn't bear to look at someone as stupid as me. Sim threw his hands into the air. She was expelled from Malfeasance. What were you thinking? Sorry, am I yelling too loud? My cats are like... Um. No, Willem said to Simmon. She was expelled for conduct unbecoming. There was no proof of Malfeasance. I really don't think it was her, I said. She's quite nice, actually. Friendly. Besides, it's only a six-talent loan, and I'm not late paying her back. She doesn't have any reason to do something like this. Willem gave me a long, steady look. Just to explore all possibilities, he said slowly, would you do something for me? I nodded. Think back on your last few conver conversings with her, Willem said. Take a moment and sift them piece by piece and see if you remember doing or saying something that might have offended or upset her. I thought back on our last conversation, playing it through my playing it through in my head. She was interested in a certain piece of information that I didn't give her. How interested? Willem's voice was slow and patient, as if he were talking to a rather dim-witted child. Rather interested, I said. Rather does not indicate a degree of intensity. I said. I sighed. Fine. Extremely interested. Interested enough to... I stopped. Willem arched a knowing eyebrow at me. Yes, what have you just remembered? I hesitated. She might have also offered to sleep with me, I said. Willem nodded calmly, as if he expected something of this sort. And you responded to this young woman's generous offer in what way? I felt my cheeks get hot. I, I sort of just ignored it. Willem closed his eyes, his expression conveying a vast, weary dismay. This is so much worse than Ambrose, Sim said, putting his head in his hands. Devi doesn't have to worry about the masters or anything. They say she could do an eight-part binding. Eight! I was in a tight space, I said, a little testily. I didn't have anything to use as collateral. I'll admit it wasn't a great idea. After all this is done, we can have a symposium on how stupid I am. But for now, can we just move on? I gave them a pleading look. Willem rubbed at his eyes with one hand and gave a weary nod. Simmon made an effort to get rid of his horrified expression with only marginal success. He swallowed. Fair enough. What are we going to do? Right now, it doesn't really matter who was responsible, I said, cautiously checking to see if my arm had stopped bleeding. It had, and I peeled my bloody hand away. I'm going to take some precautionary measures. I made a shooing motion. You two go get some sleep. Sim rubbed his forehead, chuckling to himself. Body of God, you're irritating sometimes. What if you're attacked again? It's already happened twice while we've been sitting here, I said easily. It tingles a bit. I grinned at his expression. I'm fine, Sim, honestly. There's a reason I'm the top-ranked duelist in Dahl's class. I'm perfectly safe. As long as you're awake, Willem interjected, his dark eyes serious. My grin grew stiff. As long as I'm awake, I repeated. Of course. 
Willem stood up and made a show of brushing himself off. So, clean yourself and take your precautionary measures, he gave me a pointed look. Shall young Master Simon and I expect Dahl's top-ranked duelist in my room tonight? I felt myself flushed with embarrassment. Why, yes, that would be greatly appreciated. Will gave me an exaggerated bow, then opened the door and made his way out into the hall. Sim was wearing a wide grin by now. It's a date, then. But put on a shirt before you come. I'll watch over you tonight like the colicky infant you are, but I refuse to do it if you insist on sleeping naked. After Will and Sim left, I headed out the window and onto the rooftops. I left my shirt in my room, as I was a bloody mess and didn't want to ruin it. I trusted the dark night and the lateness of the hour, hoping no one would spot me running along the university rooftops, half-naked and bloody. It is relatively easy to protect yourself from sympathy if you know what you're doing. Someone tried to burn or stab me, or draw off my body heat until I lapsed into hyperthermia. All those things deal with the simple, direct application of force, so they are easy to oppose. I was safe now that I knew what was happening and kept my defenses up. My new concern was that whoever was attacking me might get discouraged and try something different. Something like dousing out my location, then resorting to a more mundane type of attack, one I couldn't stave off with an effort of will. Malfeasance is terrifying, but a thug with a sharp knife will kill you ten times quicker if he catches you in a dark alley. And catching someone off their guard is remarkably easy if you can track their every movement, movement using their blood. So I headed across the rooftops. My plan was to take a handful of autumn leaves, mark them with my blood, and send them tumbling endlessly around the house of the wind. It was a trick I'd used before. But as I jumped across the narrow alley, I saw lightning flicker in the clouds and smelled rain in the air. A storm was coming. Not only would the rain mat down the leaves, keeping them from moving around, but it would wash my blood away as well. Standing there on the rooftop, feeling like I'd had twelve colors of hell beaten out of me, brought back unsettling echoes of my years in Tarbian. I watched the distance, distant lightning for a moment and tried not to let the feeling overwhelm me. I forced myself to remember I wasn't the same helpless, starving child I'd been back then. I heard the faint, drum-like sound as a piece of tin roofing bent behind me. I stiffened, then relaxed as I heard Ari's voice. Kvath? I looked to my right and saw her small shape standing a dozen feet away. The clouds were hiding the moon, but I could hear a smile in her voice as she said, I saw you running across the tops of things. I turned the rest of the way around to face her, glad there wasn't much light. I didn't like to think how Ari might react to the sight of me half-naked and covered in blood. Hello, Ari, I said. There's a storm coming. You shouldn't be on top of... You shouldn't be up on the tops of things tonight. She tilted her head. You are, she said simply. I sighed. I am, but only... A great spider of lightning crawled across the sky, illuminating everything for the space of a long second. Then it was gone, leaving me flash-blind. Ari? I called, worried the sight of me had scared her off. There was another flicker of lightning, and I saw her standing closer. She pointed at me, grinning delightedly. You look like an Amir, she said. Kvath is one of the Siridae. I looked down at myself, and with the next lightning flicker, I saw what she meant. I had dried blood running down the back of my hands from when I'd been trying to stanch my wounds. It looked like the old tattoos the Amir used, had used to mark their highest-ranking members. I was so surprised by her reference that I forgot the first thing I'd learned about Ari. I forgot to be careful and asked her a question. Ari, how do you know about the Siridae? There was no response. The next flicker of lightning showed me nothing but an empty rooftop and an unforgiving sky. Drink some water. I don't know what what these plum bobs are that you're referring to. Uh, yeah, I already did pull a Batman. <laughs> that was very Batman like just lightning and then she's gone. Okay, chapter twenty four. Clinks. I stood on the rooftops with the storm flickering over my head overhead, my heart heavy in my chest. I wanted to follow Ari and apologize, but I knew it was hopeless. The wrong sort of questions made her run, and when Ari bolted, she was like a rabbit down a hole. Or Batman. There were a thousand places she could hide in the underthing. I didn't have a chance of finding her. Besides, I had vital matters to attend to. Even now, someone could be dousing out my location. I simply didn't have the time. It took me the better part of an hour to make my way across the rooftops. The flickering light of the storm made things harder rather than easier, binding me, blinding me for long moments after every flash. Still, I eventually made my limping way to the roof of Mains, where I typically met Ori. Stiffly, I climbed down the apple tree to the, the enclosed courtyard. 
I was about to call down through the heavy metal grating that led to the underthing when I saw a flicker of movement in the shadow of the nearby tree bushes. I peered into the dark, unable to see anything but a vague shape. Ari? I asked gently. I don't like telling, she said softly, her voice thick with tears. Of all the awful things I'd been part of these last couple days, this was unquestionably the worst of it. I'm so sorry, Ari, I said. I won't ask again, I promise. There was a tiny sob from the shadows that froze my heart solid and broke off a piece of it. What were you doing out on top of things tonight? I asked. I knew this was a safe question. I'd asked it many times before. I was looking at the lightning, she said, sniffling. Then, oh, then, I saw one that looked like a tree. What was in the lightning? I asked softly. Galvanic ionization, she said. Then, after a pause, she added, and river ice, and the sway a, cattail, a cattail makes. I wish I'd seen that one, I said. What were you doing on top of things? She paused and gave a tiny hiccuping laugh. All crazy and mostly naked. My heart began to thaw a bit. I was looking for a place to put my blood, I said. Most people keep that inside, she said. It's easier. I want to keep the rest of it inside, I explained, but I'm worried someone might be looking for me. Oh, she said, as if she understood perfectly. I saw the slightly darker shadow of her, mo of her move, in move in the darkness standing up. You should come with me to Clink's. I don't think I've seen Clink's, I said. Have you taken me there before? There was a motion that might have been a shaking of the head. It's private. I heard a metallic noise, then a rustle, then I saw a blue-green light well up from the op open grate. I climbed down and met her in the tunnel underneath. The light in her hand showed smudges across her face, probably from where I'd she eh, probably from where she'd been rubbing away her tears. It was the first time I'd ever seen Ari dirty. Her eyes were darker than normal, and her nose was red. Ari sniffed and rubbed her blotchy face. You, she said gravely, are a dreadful mess. I looked down at my bloody hands and chest. I am, I agreed. Then she gave a tiny, brave smile. I didn't run so far this time, she said, tilting her chin proudly. I'm glad, I said, and I'm sorry. No, she gave her head a tiny, firm shake. You are my Cyride, and thus above reproach. She reached out to touch the center of my bloody chest with a finger. Ivara enim uge. I can't pronounce these words. Ari led me through the maze of tunnels that comprised the under that comprised the underthing. We went further down through the vaults, past crick past cricklet. Then we moved through several twisting hallways and down again, using a stone spiral staircase I'd never seen before. I smelled damp stone and heard the low, smooth sound of running water as we descended. Every once in a while, there was the gritty sound of... What are you doing? Sorry, my cat's... I don't know if... You can't see, probably. Yeah, he's... He was, like, digging his head into my stomach. <laughs> okay. Um... After about 50 steps, the wide, spiraling staircase disappeared into a vast, roiling pool of black water. I wondered how far the stairs continued below the surface. There wasn't any smell of rot or foulness. It was a fresh water, and I could see ripples as it swirled in the stairwell and spread out into the dark beyond where our lights could reach. Beyond where our lights could, could reach. I heard the clink of glass again and saw two bottles spinning and bobbing on the surface, moving first one way, then another. One ducked under the surface and didn't come up again. There was a burlap sack hanging from a brass torch bracket mounted into the wall. Ari reached into the bag and pulled out a heavy stoppered bottle of the sort that might have once held Braden beer. She handed me the bottle. They disappear for an hour, or a minute, sometimes for days. Sometimes they don't come back at all. She brought another bottle out of the sack. It's best to have at least four going at once. That way, statistically, you should always have two moving around. I nodded, and I pulled a strand of burlap from the tattered sack and daubed it with the blood that covered my hand. I uncorked the bottle and dropped it inside. Hair, too. Ari said. I pulled a few from my head and thread, thread, eh, threaded them through the bottle's mouth. Then I drove the cork in hard and set it floating. It rode low in the water, circling erratically. Ari handed me another bottle and we repeated the process. When the fourth bottle was swept out into the swirling water, Ari nodded and dusted her hands briskly against the other, each other. There, she said with a tone of immense satisfaction. That's good. We're safe. Hours later, washed, bandaged, and considerably less naked... I made my way to it spelled N E K K I D. I made my way to Willem's room in the Muse. That night, and for many more to come, Will and Sim took turns watching over me as I slept, keeping me safe with their alar. They were the best sort of friends. 
the sort everyone hopes for, but no one deserves, least of all me. Oh. Okay, let's see. Where are we at? I think this is another longer one, but let me keep an eye on the time. Okay. Chapter 25, Wrongful Apprehension. Despite what... Oh, let me drink water. Sorry. Despite what Will and Sim believed, I couldn't believe Debbie was responsible for the malfeasance against me. While I was painfully aware that I knew next to nothing about women, she had always been friendly to me, even sweet at times. True, she had a grim reputation, but I knew better than anyone how quickly a handful of rumors could turn into full-blown fairy stories. I thought it much more likely that my unknown assailant was simply a bitter student who resented my advancement in the Arcanum. Most students studied for years before they reached Rilar, and I had managed it in less than three terms. It could even be someone who simply hated the Yedima Rua. It wouldn't be the first time that they, that had earned me a beating. In some ways, it really didn't matter who was responsible for the attacks. What I needed was a way to stop them. I couldn't expect Will and Sim to watch over me for the rest of my life. I needed a more permanent solution. I needed a gram. A gram is a clever piece of artificery designed for just this sort of problem. It is a sort of sympathetic armor that prevents anyone from making a binding against your body. I didn't know how they worked, but I knew they existed, and I knew where to find out how to make one. Kilvin looked up as I approached his office. I was relieved to see his glasswork was cold and dark. I trust you are well, Rilarquoth, he asked without getting up from the work table. He was holding a large hemisphere of glass in one hand and a diamond stylus in the other. I am, Mr. Kilvin, I, said, I lied. Have you been thinking about your next project, he asked. Have you been dreaming clever dreams? I was actually looking for a schema for a gram, Master Kilvin, but I can't find it in any of the bolt holes or reference books. Kilvin looked at me curiously. And why would you be needing a gram, Rilarkvoth? Such a desire does not reflect good faith in your fellow arcanists. Unsure as to whether he was joking or not, I decided to play it straight. We've been learning about slippage and adept sympathy. I was thinking that if a gram works to deny outside affinities... Kilvin gave a low chuckle. Dahl has been throwing fear into you. Good. And you are correct. A gram would help protect against slippage. His dark, sealedish eyes gave me a serious look. To a degree. However, it seems a clever student would simply learn his lessons and avoid slippage through proper care and caution. I intend to, Master Kilvin, I said. Still, a gram strikes me as a useful thing to have. There is truth to that, Kilvin admitted, nodding his shaggy head. However, with repairs and the filling of our autumn orders, we are understaffed. He waved a hand toward the window that looked out onto, into the workshop. I cannot spare any workers to make such a thing, and even if I could, there is an issue of cost. They require delicate work, and gold is needed for the inlay. I'd prefer to make my own, Master Kilvin. Kilvin shook his head. There is reason the schema is not in the reference books. You are not far enough along to be making your own. One must be careful when meddling with sigildry and in one's own blood. I opened my mouth to say something, but he cut me off. More important, the sigildry necessary for such a device is only entrusted to those who have reached the ranks of Eltha. The runes for blood and bone have too great a potential for misuse. His tone let me know there was nothing to be gained by arguing, so I shrugged it off as I could I shrugged it off as I could as if I couldn't care less. It's no matter, Master Kilvin. I have other projects to occupy my time. Kilvin gave me a wide smile. I am sure you do, Rilarkvoth. I am waiting with great eagerness to see what you will make for me. A thought struck me. To that purpose, Master Kilvin, could I have the use of one of the private workrooms? I'd rather not have everyone looking over my shoulder while I'm tinkering. Kilvin's eyebrows went up at this. Now I am doubly curious. He set down the hemisphere of glass, got to his feet, and opened a drawer in his desk. Will one of the first floor workrooms suit you, or is there a chance of something exploding? I will give you one on the third floor if that's the case. They are colder, but the roof is better suited for that sort of thing. I looked at him for a moment, trying to decide if he was joking. A first floor room will be fine, Master Kilvin, but I need a small sh smelter and a little extra room to breathe. Kilvin muttered to himself, then brought out a key. How much breathing will you be doing? Room 27 is 500 feet square. That should be plenty, I said. I also might need permission to get precious metals from stocks. Kilvin chuckled at this and nodded as he handed me the key. I will see it is done, Rilarkvoth. I look forward to seeing what you will make for me. It was galling that the schema I needed was restricted. 
But there are always other ways of finding information, and there are always people who know more than they are supposed to. For example, I didn't doubt Manit knew how to make a gram. Everyone knew he was an Illyr in title only. But there was no way he would share the information with me against Kilvin's wishes. The university had been Manit's home for thirty years, and he was probably the only student who feared expulsion more than me. This meant my options were limited. Other than a lengthy search of the archives, I, could think of, I couldn't think of any way to get a schema on my own. So after several minutes of racking my brain for a better option, I made my way to the Bale and Barley. The Bale was one of the more just disreputable taverns this side of the river. Anchors wasn't seedy in the strictest sense. It simply lacked pretension. It was clean without smelling of flowers and inexpensive without being tawdry. People visited Anchors to eat, drink, listen to music, and occasionally have a friendly fight. The bale was several rungs farther down the ladder. It was grubbier, music was not a priority, and the fights were usually only recreational for one of the people for one of the people involved. Mind you, the bale wasn't as bad as half the places in Tarbian, but it was the worst you were likely to find this close to the university. So despite being seedy, it had, it had wooden floors and glass in the windows, and if you passed out drunk and woke up missing your purse, you could content yourself with the fact that nobody had knifed you and stolen your boots as well. As it was still early in the day, there were a bare handful of people scattered around the common room. I was glad to see Sleet sitting in the back. I hadn't actually met him, but I knew who he was. I'd heard stories. Sleet was one of the rare, indispensable people who have a knack for arranging things. From what I'd heard, he'd been a student on and off for the last ten years. He was talking with a nervous-looking man at the moment, and I knew better than to interrupt. So I bought two mugs of short beer and made a pretense of drinking one while I waited. Sleet was, a, was handsome, dark-haired, and dark-eyed. Though he didn't have the characteristic beard, I expected he was at least half sealedish His body language screamed authority. He moved as if he were in control of everything around him. Which wouldn't have surprised me, actually. He could own the bail for all, all I knew. He could own the bail for all I knew. People like Sleet are no strangers to money. Sleet and the anxious young man finally came to some sort of agreement. Sleet smiled warmly as they shook hands and clapped the man on the shoulder as he walked away. I waited for a moment, then made my way over to his table. As I came closer, I noticed there was a stretch of open floor between his table and the others in the common room. It wasn't much, just enough so eavesdropping would be difficult. Sleet looked up as I approached. I was wondering if we could talk, I said. He made an expansive gesture to the empty chair. This is a bit of a surprise, he said. Why is that? I don't get a lot of clever folks paying me visits. I get desperate folks. He looked at the mugs. Are those both for you? You can have either or both. I nodded at the one on the right, but I've already had my mouth on that one. He looked at the mugs warily for a fraction of a second, then gave, me, then gave a wide white smile and, look, and took the drink on the left. From what I've heard, you're not the sort of... From what I've heard, you're not the sort to poison a man. You seem to know a lot about me, I said. His shrug was so casual I'd guessed he'd practiced it. I know a lot about everyone, he said. But I know more about you. Why's that? Sleet slouched forward, leaning on the table and speaking in a confidential tone. Do you have any idea how boring your average student is? Half of them are rich tourists who don't care half a damn, a, half a damn for their classes. He rolled his eyes and gestured as if throwing something over his shoulder. The other half are bookish tits who have dreamed of this place so long they can hardly breathe once they're here. They walk on eggshells, meek as priests, scared lest the masters cast a disapproving eye in their direction. He sniffed disdainfully and leaned back in his seat. Suffice to say, you're a breath of fresh air. Everyone says... He stopped and gave his practiced shrug again. Well, you know. Actually, I don't, I admitted. What do people say? Sleet gave me a sharp, beautiful smile. Ah, that's the problem, isn't it? Everyone knows a man's reputation except the man himself. For most men, this isn't a bother. But some of us labor over our reputations. I have built mine brick by brick. It is a useful tool. He gave me a sly look. I expect you understand what I am talking about. I allowed myself a smile. Perhaps. What do they say about me, then? Tell me and I'll return the favor. Well, you're good at finding things, I said. You're discreet but expensive. He waved his hands, irritated. Vagaries. Details are the bones of the story. Give me bones. I thought... I heard you managed to sell several vials of... Re uh, God. Regime Ignol Neratum, last term, after the fire in Kilton's shop where all of it was supposedly destroyed. Sleet nodded, his expression giving away nothing. I heard you arranged to get a message to Vayne's father in Imlin, despite the fact that there was a siege going on. 
Another nod. You got a young prostitute working in buttons, a set of documents proving she was a distant bloodline cousin of the Baronet, Baronet Gamera, allowing her to marry a certain young gentleman with minimal fuss. Sleet smiled. I was proud of that one. When you were in Allier, I continued, you were suspended for two terms on charges of wrongful apprehension. Two years later, you were fined and suspended again for misuse of university equipment in the crucible. I've heard Jameson knows the sort of business you do, but he's paid to turn a blind eye. I don't believe the last one, by the way. Fair enough, he said easily. Neither do I. Despite your extensive activities, you've only been brought up against the iron law once, I continued. Transport of contraband substances, wasn't it? Sleet rolled his eyes. You know the damnedest thing? I was actually innocent of that one. Heffron's boys paid off a constable to fake some evidence. The charges were withdrawn after only two days, he scowled. Not that the masters cared. All they gave a damn about was that I was out there besmirching the university's good name. His tone was bitter. My tuition tripled after that. I decided to push matters a bit. Several months ago, you poisoned a young earl's daughter with v venetacin and only gave her the antidote after she signed over the largest of the fiefdoms she stood to inherit. Then you staged it to look like she'd lost it playing a game of high-stakes faro. He raised an eyebrow at this. Do they say why? No, I said. I assume she tried to default on her debt to you. There's some truth to that, he said, though it was a bit more complicated, and it wasn't Benetazen. That would be extraordinarily reckless. He looked offended and brushed at his sleeve, plainly irritated. Anything else? I paused, trying to decide if I wanted to get confirmation about something I'd suspected for some time. Some time. Only that last term you put Ambrose Jackus in touch with a pair of men who have been known to kill people for money. Sleet's expression remained impassive, his body loose and relaxed. But I could see a slight tension in his shoulders. Very little escapes me when I'm watching closely. They say that, do they? I gave a shrug that put his to shame. My shrug was so nonchalant it would make a cat jealous. I'm a musician. I play three nights a span in a busy tavern. I hear all manner of things. I reached for my mug. And what have you heard of me? The same stories everyone else knows, of course. You convinced the masters to admit you to the university, though you're just a pup, no offense. Then two days later, you shame Master Him in his own classroom and get away bird-free. Save for a whipping. Save for a whipping, he acknowledged. During which you couldn't be bothered to cry out or bleed even a little. I wouldn't believe that if there weren't several hundred witnesses. We drew a decent crowd, I said. It was good weather for a whipping. Uh, my cats don't shrug, so I don't think they would be jealous of that. Um, I've heard some overly dramatic folk call you Quoth the Bloodless because of it, he said. Though I'm guessing part of it, that comes from the fact that you're Edima Ru, which means you're about as far from a blooded noble as a person can be. I smiled. A bit of both, I expect. He looked thoughtful. I've heard you and Master Illidan fought in Haven. Vast and terrible magics were unleashed, and in the end he won by throwing you through a stone wall, then off the roof of a building, of the building. Do they say what we fought over? I asked. All manner of things, he said dismissively. An insult. A misunderstanding. You tried to steal his magic. He tried to steal your woman. Typical nonsense. Sleet rubbed at his face. Let me see. You play the lute passing well and are proud as a kicked cat. You, you are unmannerly, sharp-tongued, and show no respect for your betters, which is practically everyone, given your lowly ravel birth. I felt a flush of anger start, start in my face and sweep hot and prickling down the entire length of my body. I am the best musician you will ever meet or see from a distance, I said with forced calm, and I am a Dima Rua to my bones. That means my blood is red. It means I breathe the free air and walk where my feet take me. I do not cringe and fawn like a dog at a man's title. That looks like pride to people who have spent their lives cultivating supple spines. Sleet gave a lazy smile, and I realized he'd been baiting me. You also have a temper, so I've heard. And there's a whole boatload of other assorted nonsense floating around you as well. You only sleep an hour each night. You have demon blood. You can talk to the dead. I leaned forward, curious. That wasn't one of the rumors I'd started. Really? Do I talk to spirits, or are they claiming I'm digging up bodies? I'm assuming spirits, he said. I haven't heard anyone mention grave robbing. I nodded. Anything else? 
Only that you were cornered in an alley last term by two men who kill people for money, and despite the fact that they had knives and caught you quite unaware, you blinded one and beat the other senseless, calling down fire and lightning like Taborlin the Great. We looked at each other for a long moment. It was not a comfortable silence. Did you put Ambrose in touch with them? I asked at last. That, Sleet said frankly, is not a good question. It implies I discuss private dealings after the fact. He gave me a... He gave me a flat look, no hint of a smile anywhere near his mouth or eyes. Besides, would you trust me to answer honestly? I frowned. I can say, however, that because of those stories, nobody is much interested in taking that sort of job again, Sleet said conversationally. Not that there is much call for that sort of work around here to begin with. We're all terribly civilized. Not that you would know about it, even if it were going on. His smile came back. Exactly. He leaned forward. Enough chatter, then. What is it you're looking for? I need a schema for a piece of artificing. He set his elbows on the table. And? It contains Sigildry Kilvin restricts to those of Eltha rank and higher. Sleet nodded matter-of-factly. And how quickly do you need it? Hours? Days? I thought about Will and Sim staying up nights to watch over me. Sooner is better. Sleet looked thoughtful, his eyes unfocused. It's going to cost, and there's no guarantee I'll be able to produce it on an exact schedule. He focused in on me. Also, if you get caught, you'll be charged with wrongful apprehension at the very least. I nodded. And you know what the penalties are? For wrongful apprehension of the arcane not leading to injury or of another, I recited, the offending student may be fined no more than twenty talents, whipped no more than ten times, suspended from the arcanum, or expelled from the university. They fined me the full twenty talents and suspended me two terms, Sleet said grimly. And that was only some Rilara level alchemy. It will be much worse with you if this is the Eltha level stuff. How much? I asked. To get a hold of it in a few days, he looked up at the ceiling for a moment. Thirty talents. I felt the bottom drop out of my stomach, but I kept my face composed. Is there any room to negotiate that? He gave his sharp smile again. His teeth were very white. I also deal in favors, he said, but a thirty talent favor is going to be a big one. He looked at me th thoughtfully. We could perhaps work out something along those lines, but I feel obliged to mention that when I call a favor due, it's due. At that point, there isn't any negotiation. I nodded calmly to show him I understood, but I felt a cold knot forming in my gut. This was a bad idea. I knew it in my bones. Do you owe anyone else? Sleet asked. And don't lie to me or I'll know. Six talents, I said casually. Do at the end of the term. He nodded. I'm guessing you didn't manage to get it off some money lender. Did you go to Hefron? I shook my head. Devi. For the first time in our conversation, Sleet lost his composure. His charming smile fell away entirely. Devi? He pulled himself up in his chair, his body suddenly tense. No, I don't think we can come to an arrangement. If you had cash, it would be one thing. He shook his head. But no, if Devi already owns a piece of you. His reaction chilled me. Then I realized he was just angling for more money. What if I were to borrow money from you so I could settle my debt with her? Sleet shook his head, regaining a piece of his shattered nonchalance. That is the very definition of poaching, he said. Devi has an ongoing interest in you, an investment. He took a drink and cleared his throat meaningfully. She does not look kindly on other folk interfering where she's staked her claim. I raised an eyebrow. I guess I was taken in by your reputation, I said. Silly of me, really. His face cre creased into a frown. What do you mean by that? I waved my hands dismissively. Please, give me credit for being at least half as clever as you've heard, I said. If you can't get what I want, just admit it. Don't waste my time by pricing things out of my reach or coming up with elaborate excuses. Sleet seemed unsure if he should be offended. What part of this seems elaborate to you? Come now, I said. You're willing to run against the laws of the university, risk the wrath of the masters, the constables, and the iron law of Autour. But a little slip of a girl makes you, your knees quivery? I sniffed and mimicked the gesture he'd made before, pretending to ball something up and throw it away over my shoulder. He looked at me for a moment, then burst out laughing. Yes, that's exactly the case, he said, wiping tears of genuine amusement from his eyes. Apparently I was fooled by your reputation, too. If you think Debbie is a little slip of a girl, you aren't nearly as clever as I thought. Looking over my shoulder, Sleet nodded at someone I couldn't see and waved his hand dismissively. Go on with you, he said. I have business to do with rational people who know the true shape of the world. You're wasting my time. I felt myself prickling with irritation, but forced myself to keep it off my face. 
I also need a crossbow, I said. He shook his head. No, I've already told you. No loans or favors. I can offer goods in exchange. He looked at me skeptically. What sort of crossbow? Any sort, I said. It needn't be fancy. It just needs to work. Eight talents, he said. I gave him a hard look. Don't insult me. This is mundane contraband. I'll bet ten to a penny you can have one in two hours. If you try to gouge me, I'll just go over the river and get one from Hefron. Get one from Hefron and you'll have to carry it back from Imra, he said. Constable would love seeing that. I shrugged and began to get to my feet. Three talents and five, he said. It'll be used, mind you, and a stirrup, not a, tr not a crank. I calculated in my head. Will you accept an ounce of silver and a spool of finely drawn gold wire? I asked, bringing them out from the pockets of my cloak. Sleet's dark eyes unfocused slightly as he did his own inter internal calculations. You drive a tight bargain. He picked up the spool of bright wire and the small ingot of silver. There's a rain barrel behind the grimson, grimson tannery. The crossbow will be, will be there in fifteen minutes. He gave me an insulted look. Two hours. You don't know anything about me at all. Water. Hours later, Fela emerged from the shelves in the archives and caught me with one hand against the four-plate door. I wasn't pushing on it exactly, just pressing, just checking to see if it was firmly closed. It was. I don't suppose they'll tell Scribs what's behind this, I asked her without any hope. If they do, they haven't told me yet, Fela said, stepping close and reaching out to run her fingers along the grooves the letters made in the stone. Volaritas. I had a dream about the door once, she said. Volaritas was the name of an old dead king. His tomb was behind the door. Wow, I said. That's better than the dreams I have about it. What are yours? she asked. Once I dreamt I saw a light through the keyholes, I said. But mostly I'm just standing there, staring at it, trying to get in. I frowned at the door. As if standing outside while I'm awake isn't frustrating enough, I do it while I'm asleep, too. Fela laughed softly at that, then turned away from the door to face me. I got your note, she said. What's the research project you were so vague about? Let's go somewhere private to talk, I said. It's a bit of a story. We made our way to one of the reading holes, and once the door was closed, I told her the whole story, embarrassments and all. Someone was practicing malfeasance against me. I couldn't go to the master's for fear of revealing I was the one who had broken into Ambrose's rooms. I needed I needed a gram to protect myself, but I didn't know enough sigildry to make one. Malfeasance, she said in a low voice, slowly shaking her head in dismay. You're sure? I unbuttoned my shirt and took it down off my shoulder, revealing the dark bruise on my shoulder from the attack I'd only managed to partially stop. She leaned in to look at it. And you really don't know who it might be? Not really, I said, trying not to think of Devi. I wanted to keep that particular bad decision to myself for now. I'm sorry to drag you into this, but you're the only one. Vela waved her hands in negation. None of that. I told you to ask if you ever needed a favor, and I'm glad you did. I'm glad you're glad, I said. If you can get me through this, I'll owe you instead. I'll owe you instead. I'm getting better at finding what I want in here, but I'm still new. Vela nodded. It takes years to learn your way around the stacks. It's like a city. I smiled. That's how I think of it, too. I haven't lived here long enough to learn all the shortcuts. Vela grimaced a bit. And I'm guessing you're going to need those. If Kilvin really believes the Sigildry is dangerous, most of the books you want will be in his private library. I felt a sinking sensation in my stomach. Private library? All the masters have private libraries, Vela said matter-of-factly. I know some alchemy, so I help spot books with formulae Mandrag wouldn't want in the wrong hands. Scribs who know Sigildry do the same for Kilvin. But this is pointless, then, I said. If Kilvin has all those books locked away, there's no chance of finding what I'm looking for. Fela smiled, shaking her head. The system isn't perfect. Only about a third of the archives are properly catalogued. What you're looking for is probably still in the stacks somewhere. It's just a matter of finding it. I wouldn't even need a whole schema, I said. If I just knew a few of the proper runes, I could probably just fake the rest. She gave me a worried look. Is that really wise? Wisdom is a luxury I can't afford, I said. Will and Sim have already been watching over me for two nights. They can't sleep in shifts for the next ten years. Fela drew a deep breath and then let it out slowly. Right. We can start with the catalog books first. Maybe what you need has slipped past the scribs. We collected several dozen books on sil sigildry and closeted ourselves in, in an out-of-the-way reading hole on the fourth floor. Then we started going through them one at a time. We began with, the, with hopes of finding a full-fledged schema for a gram. But as the hours slid by, we lowered our hopes. 
If not a whole schema, perhaps we could find a description of one, perhaps a reference to the sequence of runes used, the name of a single rune, a hint, a clue, a scrap, some piece of the puzzle. I closed the last of the books we had brought back to the reading hole. It made a solid thump as the pages settled together. Nothing? she asked tiredly. Nothing. I rubbed my face with both hands. So much for getting lucky. Fella shrugged, grimacing halfway through the motion, then craned her head to one side to stretch a kink out of her neck. It made sense to start in the most obvious places, she said, but those will be the same places the scribs have combed over for Kilvin. We'll just have to dig deeper. I heard the distant sound of the belling tower and was surprised at how many times it struck. We've been researching, we've been researching for over four hours. You've missed your class, I said. It's just geom geometries, she said. You're a wonderful person, I said. What's our best option now? A long, slow trawl of the stacks, she said. But it's going to be like panning for gold. Dozens of hours, and that's with both of us working together so we don't overlap our efforts. I can bring in Will and Sim to help, I said. Willem works here, Fela said, but Simmons never been a scrib. He'll probably just get in the way. I gave her an odd look. Do you know Sim very well? Not very, she admitted. I've seen him around. You're underestimating him, I said. People do it all the time. Sim's smart. Everyone here is smart, Fela said, and Sim is nice, but... That's the problem, I said. He's nice. He's gentle, which people see as weak. And he's happy, which people see as stupid. I didn't mean it like that, Fela said. I know, I said, rubbing at my face. I'm sorry, it's been a bad couple of days. I thought the university would be different than the rest of the world, but it's just like everywhere else. People cater to pompous, rude bastards like Ambrose, while the good souls like Simmon get brushed off as simpletons. Which one are you? Fela said with a smile as she began to stack up the books. Pompous bastard or good soul? I'll research that later, I said. Right now I've got more pressing concerns. My auto white balance is going ballistic? Oh, no, sorry. I'm, I don't know why. Can we squeeze in one more chapter? Ah, uh, maybe. 12 minutes. And... It's like four and a half, five pages. Um... I think I'll stop here, just because I don't want to risk cutting into the next one and give you guys a little breathing breather before Harry Potter. So I'll stop here. That was a good stopping point anyway. Um, I literally did nothing. I just, like, m moved a little. But I'm glad it's fine now that the video is about to end. Um, okay, I will talk to you guys later. I think after... I haven't streamed in forever. I might play more Last of Us 2 after Harry Potter, so we'll see. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see how I feel. Alright, see you guys later.